get started, all right? Sounds good. Great. Well, welcome one and all to this truly, truly unique monthly reading series. It's the vision of the wonderful poets at Headmistress Press, Mary Miriam, Risa Denenberg, and Rita May Reese. Today's feature is Minnie Bruce Pratt, card 12. Reading and sharing her work as well as the work of card number one, Naomi Replansky from the first series in the Lesbian Trading Card series released in 2015. A reminder that you can purchase your trading cards, as well as Headmistress Press titles at the Headmistress Press website. Well, I'm not going to waste any time in moving to our featured reader for today. It is my unbelievable, giving me chills pleasure to introduce to all of you Minnie Bruce Pratt, and to say that Minnie Bruce Pratt is an icon of LGBTQ literature only scratches the surface of her contributions as an artist and an activist. Any one of her books of poetry would anchor a groundbreaking career. And she has eight of them, including her newest, Magnified a very fitting title, as each one of her books has truly expanded, magnified, and amplified our understanding prismatically of human experiences and existence. She is an anchor in my personal literary canon. And I, as I said, I could not be any more honored than to be hosting this program to welcome her today. Well, let me read the card for you as I am accustomed to doing. Minnie Bruce Pratt, born in Alabama in 1946. Minnie Bruce Pratt came out as a lesbian in 1975, earned a PhD in English literature and participated in the great liberation struggles of the 20th century, continuing on into the 20th Years in Struggle co-authored was chosen as one of the 100 best lesbian and gay nonfiction books of all time. And Pratt has published, says seven on the card, but now eight books of poetry, including Crime Against Nature from Firebrand Books, 1990, which was chosen as a New York Times notable book of the year, the Laman Poetry Selection by the Academy of American Poets and the American Library Association Gay and Lesbian Book Award for Literature. That's just one book, my friends. She received the Lambda Literary Award for Poetry for The Dirt She Ate from University of Pittsburgh Press in 2003, the New York Times Book Review called Minnie Bruce Poems Original, Startling, and Publishers Weekly called them hard-edged and provocative, dealing directly and explicitly with issues of anger, shame, sexuality, and injustice. It is, it is my great, great pleasure, honor, put fill in the blank word, there are not enough, that I could say um, to welcome Minnie Bruce Pratt. Thank you, Sandy. Thank you, Sandy. And you can hear me okay, yes? Great. Well, I'm very humbled by that introduction. I'm really happy to be here. It's such a hard time in terms of isolation. So many thanks to Mary Miriam, Risa, Sandy, all the collectible folks, the collectible, collectible folks, 
and and headmistress press for getting us together um i was so i was so honored to be one of the the batch of 12 um to be with to be with audrey to be with judy right and of course all the others in that batch but to be with naomi right so uh, this is my, you know, this is my box that I got sent that I'm holding on to forever. Um, so I want to talk to talk. A, I wanted to talk first about Naomi and also quote some of her poems, and then we're going to listen to her actually read some of her poems. So the first and only time that I that I met Naomi and spent any time with her was in 2007. Uh, during Pride Month that year, the Lambda Literary Foundation held a celebration of historic writers at the LGBTQ Center in New York City. They called it Better Read Than Dead, R-E-A-D, Better Read Than Dead. <laughs> we were all older at that point, not as old as we are now though. Um, both Naomi and I were among the readers. We only spoke briefly, but we exchanged books. So this is the book that Naomi gave me then. I don't know if you can read. There's a little inscription, but you can see her handwriting. Um, and, and I want to say, Naomi, I don't know if you're watching now or if you will watch this on tape later on, but I want to send you my warmest greetings my sisterly and queer hugs, and so many thanks for your poetry and for the example of your life lived with great integrity, grit, wit, passion, and radical political dedication. And I have to say, I wish I had known when I met you what I know now, because I would have taken a path to know you better and to spend time with you more close up. And I didn't, didn't do that then. So I'm trying to do that a little bit this afternoon. And I'm hoping that today says some fragment of how I honor and appreciate you and your work and your life. So um, those of you who've looked at your cards know something of Naomi's story in, in her collectible cards. But um, to understand, uh, the, what, the, one of the things that is said on the card is Naomi has been a warrior for justice. So for us to know a little bit more about how that's true of Naomi, uh, I'm gonna give some more details. And as I do that, I'm gonna show you some pictures of Naomi. So um, I'm gonna share my screen now. I hope I'm doing this correctly. Now, is that good? Yes, excellent, Risa, thank you for that coaching. Um, so Naomi was born to working class Russian Jewish immigrants in the Bronx in 1918. This is, my mother was born in 1911. So that gives you kind of an idea of our generational um, span, Naomi to me. Naomi wrote her first poem when she was 10 in response to the movie Metropolis, which some of you may have seen. It's a very early experimental metropolis of industrialization. Her opening lines to that poem were, quote, hark, Hear the bell's sad muffled roar, and through the open door come millions of workers with bodies worn. The overseers look at them with scorn. She was 10 when she wrote those lines. She continued writing poetry as a teenager. She grew up. For years, she worked in offices, on assembly lines, as a lay the operator, she did translations. She finally gained, gained enough resources to go to UCLA. She became an early computer programmer. During the 30s and 40s, she just de demonstrated against segregation. She picketed, leafleted. She was active in circles associated with the Communist Party. So much so that in 1949, the State Department took her passport away from her so she couldn't travel outside the US. And then they didn't give it back to her until about 10 years later. So that would have been 
around 59 or 60 that she got her passport back. Um, by the time her first collection of poetry, Ring Song, was published, which was 1952, and it was nominated for National Book Award, she had been deeply immersed in left political and cultural movements for decades and had formed, uh, whoops, sorry, I'm going a little bit too fast here, had formed um, deep, um, close literary friendships with left writers like Richard Wright, Bertolt Breck, who she translated, and George Oppen. Her politics and her life as a worker are conveyed with characteristic biting humor in her poem, uh, poems like, quote, grievances presented to the boss, the muse of lyric poetry by the International Union of Lyric Poets. That was one of her poems. Her style was forged in connections that she made between culture and class struggle. In the vernacular verse form of songs workers made up while bumming and hitchhiking for work during the depression, poems rising out of African-American blues commentary in the South and from resistance songs that emerged in movements against fascism. Her social activist poetry was first nourished again when she was 10 or 11, when she read copies of the socialist magazine, The Liberator at her aunt's apartment. And at the time, The Liberator was featuring poets like Louis Ginsburg, who was Alan's father, Carl Sandburg, Jean Toomer, and Claude McKay. The themes of her poetry included, of course, women's liberation and freedom intertwined with other struggles. Here is the ending of a, her long poem, Money Tree, to give you a flavor of that period of her work. So this is the last two stanzas. Now when she died, she died in pain. In honest sweat died she. Then with the special eyes of death, she saw the money tree. Its roots were knotted in her hands, sprang from her hands and hide. It was from herself herself, the tree grew fair and wide, while strangers plucked the last green buds before she wholly died. And of course, besides these poems around women's struggles, she published poems of lesbian relationship and queer life. And I probably shouldn't say of course, because in fact, in 1936, she published Love Poems to Another Woman in Contemporary American Women Poets, 1936. Um, in 1951, she had a poem called Sightseers. And I really identified with this because I remember being in Durham, North Carolina in, 19, in the 1980s and having this exact same experience when I went out dancing at the gay bar with my lover. So this is her poem, Naomi's poem, uh, just a little bit of it. It was a stinging indictment of straight people who considered themselves the blessed and came slumming on Saturday nights to queer bars, which the the poem characterized as the straight people seeing as the dance halls of the damned or a steaming underworld. And then Naomi writes how those straight people are baffled to see us, the queer people, dance exalted. And she says in this, um, in this passage, uh, I'm gonna give you another, another look at her. She says in this passage, uh, the straight people said, we came down from our overworld to see them writhe, to hear their cries. But would they make of this a church and hand on waist bless each other? So she's showing our world, our other world in 51 when of course, yeah, the sodomy statutes were still in place. People were 
killing themselves when they were arrested in Greenwich Village. It was 20 years, more than 25 years before the Stonewall uprising and they, Omi was writing these poems. So, um, she published uh, Ring World in 52. And then quite a bit later, she published The Dangerous World, which is when I met her, but she published it in 94. Ring World is a famous poem, uh, Ring Song, I'm sorry. Um, this is the last line. It, 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 it really, to me, speaks of her defiance, her just unbreakable defiance. It, it was another answer to those who might try to destroy queer love and beauty. So in the very last line of Ring Song, she says, when the cold does not destroy, I leap from ambush on my joy. And there's just so much, not only is there defiance in this, but it's also, you can just imagine her jumping into bed with her lover, right? Um, so I want to read uh, a longer poem of hers before I actually have you listen to her read um, herself. To me, this is one of the most eloquent of her celebrations of queer love. It's, it's very much in a classical tradition. It's a Greek classical tradition, the epithal epithalamian, a celebration of marriage, written for marriage to celebrate a marriage. But it's a queer marriage, a queer union that she's celebrating here, I think, even though, of course, the pronouns are not there. Or maybe I should say even more because the pronouns are not there. So this is from um, The Dangerous World, and it's called The Journey Here. One night when it was midnight in the bed, I turned my head and said, this red thread of error looped, looped around my wrist leads far away. I cannot now untwist myself antagonist from childhood stampings, from streets fierce in play. I stumbled through the thicket of the law. I wrestled losing with a man of straw. I reared at shadows and I walked on cloud. And from the fugitive, I took the many colored cloak and wore it somberly as though a shroud. I loved when sure of loss and swore and then stood and cursed my loss and swore myself star cross. And though I found a word, though at my breast, I warmed a word, I still was like the bird that broods the offspring of another's nest. I was I did, but I will let it be. Tonight, I must hold dear whatever brought me here, these days of mine that ran in anarchy from this rare midnight seem single with purpose, seem the slow unfolding of a single theme that led most gently to this midnight and this bed. Yeah, I love that poem. And it, to me, it's so, it just resonates to me with those early days of mine that where there was no surety that you would ever find that moment of coming to your lover in some kind of safety out of all the pain that both of you had been through to get there. So Naomi did, uh, I, I don't know for sure, but it always seems to me that poem could have been written about her lover, Eva Kolish. Eva's in the foreground here in the, in the picture and, and Naomi's in the background. Um, she and Eva were introduced uh, 
by, um, oh my goodness, the short story writer, the great Jewish short, short story writer, who is also an activist now, I'm forgetting her name. Anyway, they were introduced, they've been together since the mid eighties. Um, together with Eva, um, Naomi received the Clara Limlick Award, which honors women who've worked for the larger good their entire lives. Um, here she is. This is last year. So Naomi is 102 this year and Eva is, a, is a, about five or six years younger. I really love this picture so much because to me, this is the quintessential femme butch picture. It really is. You know, the other pictures of, of, of Naomi from her, her uh, you know, the other pictures of Naomi sometimes soften that butch look. But to me, this is it. This is the moment. I really, really love this so much. Um, so, Naomi has lived through the Spanish flu, World War I, the Great Depression, World War II, the times of the Holocaust, the Holocaust, and the Shoah and uh, the Nakba. She's lived through the rise of the Black liberation struggle, the women's liberation struggle, the disability rights liberation struggle, the LGBTQ movement. And she has been an activist and an activist writer at every step of her proud, stubborn way. Now, what I wanna do now is I have her reading three poems on um, video in it, and I'm hopefully gonna be able to navigate that well. These are all from about 2000, uh, no, 19, I think in the mid nineties, but you'll see the date is on them. And I believe they were uh, recorded at the University of Pennsylvania, which had a literary recording program going on in the nineties. Um, first, we're gonna have um, the factory poem. And I think I have to start it and then share it. We'll see how that works. Um, and let's see here. Oh, whoops, hang on, I can see. I have to share it before I start it. Give me a moment here. Um, yeah, here we go. There we go. All right. Now it's not letting me do it. Okay. Five years I worked in factories. All right. Hmm. Minnie Bruce, do you just want to play the audio then? Because we, I heard a little bit of the audio. Yeah, I, I, let me, I tell you what, give me one minute. Let me just, no um, let me get, I'm going to get out of that screen and go back into it uh, and then see if it'll let me share. No. All right. Uh, let me play the audio and then I'll try again with another one of these. So she's talking to uh, this young um, interviewer and here we go. Sorry. My first no, you're getting Margaret Atwood. I don't know why this is being so. All right, this should start all by itself now, I think. Let me give you some advice. Oh, God, you're getting Stephen King. Heaven help us. All right. I'm just going to be patient. I think it's going to do its thing.
Many Bruce, this is why it's live. Five years I worked in factories. This was during and after the war. World, World War II, II, that is. Yeah. Not the Civil War. <laughs> the tool bit curl, cut the metal curled. The oil soaked through her clothing. She made 600 parts a day and timed herself by breathing. And what she made and where it went, she did not ask or wonder. Gone to rust or to machines of pleasure or of murder. She dared not quit. She had seen those who fought like jackals over the carcass of a rotting job. Cold depression weather. As if each payday would repay. As if she'd live forever. She wished away the newborn week. And wish the day break, and wish the daylight over. Evening bell, you I long for such restless longing. Come straight in my shoulder and deliver my hands. That poem is called Factory Poem. That poem is called Factory Poem. Yeah. You had a series of industrial and clerical jobs. Uh, one of your clerical jobs was computer key operator in the early, early days of computing. What a key operator. I was a program. You were a programmer. I am, I am so sorry. <laughs> I really wanted you to hear that, right? She was like, no, you sexist pig. <laughs> now tell me, could you see this? Were you all able to see it? Great, okay, we're gonna go to the next one. I, I, I figured out what, um, what I did that didn't work. Okay, isn't that incredible? Stopped him in his tracks, boom. Okay, the next one is called Ceremony. It's important because it shows you her consciousness around fighting racism. Again, it, it, the, the struggles that are going on now have been going on for a long time. And she was deeply in the middle of that when it was happening. So um, let me hang on just a minute. I have to get my... Uh, my link for that up. It's just going to take me a second. Um, oh, I remember where it is. Here we go. It's a little tricky to... Aha, uh -huh, here we go. So these three poems that you're hearing were all um, part of the dangerous world, but they were also, I believe, part of um, her, her first book as well. So, all right, that's not it. I have to get back in. Here we go. All right, this is gonna be ceremony. Another thing that I would say radicalized me or affected me strongly was the racial 
was discrimination against black people. And uh, this poem, Ceremony, sort of I tried to express the absolute madness of segregation, discrimination. I don't know if, I don't think I really succeeded so much, but I, I'll, I'd like to read it. Um, it's called Ceremony. Who put the mask of white skin on? I said the freckled. I said the mottled. I said the pink cheeked. I said the gray face. We put up our hands and we stopped the sun and we put the mask of white skin on. Here one comes knocking without the mask. Closed, says the textbook. Packed, says the jury. Don't drink me the water. Don't pass me the front door. Only white dung, cries the sacred outhouse. Is a pale hand upon me, asks the mystic machine. Boy calls a tongue to dwindle a black man. It is death to answer and death to ask if you come knocking without the mask. Who dances this magic of race and face? I said the hungry, though hunger is skinless. I said the fearful, though fear has no face. I said the safe one, the loom lord, the landlord. Gave hunger a skin, gave fear a face. Now take your place and remember your place and dance to our magic of race and face. This was written in 1939. I won't give you his comments. Um, that was recorded in 2016. So the Black Lives Matter movement was uh, in full motion at the time that she was reading it. Um, I've got one more. Um, and this is this is Ring Song in its entirety, the title poem of her uh, book that was nominated for the National Book Award. And again, it's the same set of interviews, Pin Sound. It. I think I'm getting the swing of how to do this. Yeah. Um, all right, just a minute. It's the title poem of the 1952 National Book Award nominee ring song. Yeah, but the poem was written in 44. Right. I'm saying I the poem was written in 44. Days. Hold on to your hats, everybody. I told them the whole. I told them to hold on to their hats. This is this is quite a poem. Okay, ring song. When dot 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 at the beginning. When that joy is gone for good, I move the arms beneath the blood. When my blood is running wild. I sew the clothing of a child. When that child is never born, I lean my breast against the thorn. When the thorn brings no reprieve, I rise and live. I rise and live. When I live from hand to hand, Nude in the marketplace, I stand. When I stand and I'm not sold, I build a fire against the cold. When the cold does not destroy, 
I leap from ambush on my joy. Oh my goodness. Yeah, oh my goodness, yeah. I just identify with that all so much, so much. Um, so that's Naomi. That's Naomi. Yeah, 102 and still loving and living and yeah, fighting. Yep. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to move into my own work, but I chose the work. The, I chose what I was going to say and what I'm going to read as a way of talking about my connection to Naomi. Um, so I'll, I'll move into that that now. Um, so let me make sure I've got my ducks in a row here before I do that. Um, give me one, one minute. Desktop. Yep. And collectibles. All right. Just trying to get myself ready. So, um, The Lambda event where Naomi and I met was, as I said, was advertised as better read than dead, R-E-A-D, but actually for Naomi and me, it was really better R-E-D than dead. Yep, that's it, better read than dead, because we both belong to a long tradition of left, queer, anti-racist, pro-socialist, poet, activist, which is not the most visible part of our queer poetic tradition, but it's a very, it's very distinctly there. At the time we met, I was connected, at the time I met Naomi, I was certainly connected to and friends with contemporary poets of my own age of that tradi tradition. And I collaborated and worked with poets of that tradition in the generation immediately before me, like Adrienne Rich and Audre Lorde. But for Naomi's even earlier generation, my only connection had been through the reclaiming of women's history, radical women's history that women's liberation had brought forward and which had alerted me to work, the work of writers like Tilly Olson, I Stand Here Ironing, Yanandio, and so forth, Tell Me a, story, tell me a Riddle, uh, Muriel Ruckheiser, of course, right? And also the political history of red feminism, which is the title of a book that Kate Wiegand uh, wrote by that name, which is a wonderful history of the political um, uh, stalwarts of red feminism in the US uh, women's liberation tradition. So for me to be able to share that evening reading with Naomi was a very deep affirmation of how against tremendous odds of repression and oppressive power, we, who believe in freedom, we who believe a better world is possible, how we keep going and we bring our intertwined struggles forward for decade after decade after decade. When I, when I came out as, um, as a lesbian in, in 1975 and I, and I took up my, my poetry again, um, I really, I really had no knowledge of that tradition. I, I knew my contemporaries, but I, I really didn't know that tradition. I'm going to give you a little bit of me, myself and who I was with at that time. This is me typing in the feminary office. This is a photograph by Joni Byron or Jeb, who some of you may know as one of the very first important documentary photographers of uh, our lesbian cultural movement, who I was um, in a lover relationship with at the time. I, I knew I was Im immersed in a great moment of historical change. I, I was well aware of that. 
hang on, let me get my scroll under way here. Um, and I was doing it with other people. I was in a collective called the Feminary Collective. This was a Southern, uh, a lesbian journal for the South. I was in it with Mab Segrist and Chris South and Eleanor Holland and uh, Romina Mays and uh, Helen Langa. Helen, who's gone on to do a tremendous history of left graphic art. Um, that came out of the University of uh, California not long ago, and Mab, of course, has continued to write. But we were, you know, we were just beginning. We were just starting. Um, our politics, which was what is now called intersectional, right? That's the buzzword. We didn't have that word. We had the Kambahi River Collective Statement, and we had our our social, our political principles, which were that all these struggles were connected to each other. And we wrote from that point of view from the beginning. Uh, we knew we had to fight on all fronts and that all struggles were connected. So I don't know. I just love this. This was the first issue of the Feminary Journal. Um, and it shows Alabama and Georgia kissing. I don't know if you can see that. I really love it. Um, so uh, in a little bit, I'll read a few poems that show some of the links between my work and Naomi's work in the poetry of resistance, defiance, joy, and struggle. It's the, it's the literature that emerges from every liberation movement, the Black arts movement out of the Black liberation struggle. And we had our own current, which, you know, the women in print movement, there's a lot, a lot to be said about what was going on then, not, not time to go into that really right now. Here's the Feminary Collective at this point when we started. This is Helen on the top left. Uh, she's doing a spider web with string. This is me, Eleanor Holland to the right, Chris South down here with her knees clasped and Mab Seekers sitting in the foreground. We're sitting, we're on somebody's back porch in Durham, North Carolina. Um, so I, I started really writing seriously in Crime Against Nature uh, about my journey as a lesbian mother. Um, this, is, this is where my poetry entered the struggle on a national level. These were poems about losing custody of my children as a lesbian mother to my shock and really the shock of everybody that I was doing political work with. It won this major mainstream book award, right? And I found myself caught up in the culture wars of the 1990s, being denounced by as a pornographer on the floor of Congress by Senator Jesse Helms, who was my senator at, at the time, you understand. Um, so I want to read you, um, wanna, he, he, this is, oh, you know, Writing is not political activism directly, but it can be much of much use in the service of direct action. And this is a moment when that was happening. This is a demonstration in front of the National Endowment for the Arts building in Washington, DC. That was when they were cutting funding for the arts on the grounds that feminist, lesbians, gay men were writing pornography because we wrote about our sexuality and our sex and gender. And this is my poem. Somebody made it into a sign to hold up at the demonstration. It's not from Crime Against Nature. It's actually from my first book, uh, We Say We Love Each Other. It's about, you know, going down on somebody with anal sex and they're like walking around in the front of the NEA with this poem of mine. Um, I don't know, one of my happiest moments as a poet, I have to say. Um, so uh, let me read to you. This, this is, let me just say before I read these two poems, this is from the reprint of Crime Against Nature. It's a new edition and it is a, it is a comment on just like Headmistress Press, just like the work that you all are doing, the way the literary movement continues into the present day. This is an edition that Julie Enzer, who is the editor extraordinary of the extraordinaire of the still publishing Sinister Wisdom, lesbian journal. Uh, this was in her sapphic classics series, which is ongoing, ongoing and well worth taking a really great careful look at. So let me read um, just two short poems from Crime Against Nature. Um, 
justice come down takes on particular irony when you consider the kind of attack the poems were under from the highest levels. Justice come down, a huge sound waits bound in the ice, in the icicle roots, in the buds of snow, on fir branches, in the falling silence of snow, glittering in the sun, brilliant as a swarm of gnats, nothing but hovering wings at midday. With the sun comes noise, tongues of ice break free, fall, shatter, splinter, speak. If I could write the words. Simple like turning a page to say, write what happened. But this means a return to the cold place where I am being punished, alone to the stony circle where I am frozen, the empty space, children, mother, father, gone, lover, gone away. Their grief still sits and waits, grim, numb, keeping company with anger. I can smell my anger like sulfur struck matches. I wanted what had happened to be a wall to burn, a window to smash. At my fist, the pieces would sparkle and fall. All would be changed. I would not be alone. Instead, I have told my story over and over at parties, on the edge of meetings, my life clenched in my fist, my eyes brittle as glass. Ashamed, people turned their faces away from the woman ranting, asking, Justice, stretch out your hand, come down, glittering from where you have hidden yourself away. I think I'll just leave it there with Crime Against Nature. Um, like Naomi, my struggle against racism has been an integral part of my life. I, I certainly as a white woman raised under segregation, this is walking back up Depot Street. The cover um, graphic that you see is a painting by an Alabama uh, folk artist of ML Alabama, where one of the last lynchings in Alabama took place. I was born in Selma, actually. I was born there because it was the nearest hospital to my hometown, which was 40 miles away. But it took me a long time to find out what had really happened around me when I was growing up, including the historic actions um, like that of the march over the Selma Bridge that is now so famous that happened you know, while I was living in Alabama and that I knew nothing about. So I wrote Walking Back Up Depot Street. It has a, a main character that isn't me. Her name is Beatrice. I sent her down the road so I could learn about these things. And this is um, from Walking Back Up Depot Street. It's the end of a poem called The Road to Selma. And it's about Beatrice trying to understand what happened, but not just with her head, right? With her whole body. Beatrice wants to be, wants to be ready. The road through the courthouse, the room where her father stands over her as she marks her ballot, white rooster, black panther. Somewhere in this long hall, a hidden door, a woman hauling a tin pail of water points. Yes, past her the museum of shadows. Light opens, a woman leaves, says, I live this, I can't watch it. The video horrors pours out black and white people stumbling. Through the window, she sees rain come up a river that splits and shakes like a leaf as the Gulf wind hits it. She sees children beaten by fists of water. She sees people climb a mountain bridge to stand in mist, tear gas, men on horseback with cattle prods. The woman in the hallway whispers, one way in, one way in out. In my late 40s, I finally read 
the Communist Manifesto. This is what happens when you grow up in the McCarthy era. You really miss out on a lot. I was astonished to discover how beautiful and poetic the language of the manifesto is. And if you haven't read it in a long time, or if you've never read it, read it. What happened to me is I began to wonder, what would happen? I, I said to myself, if economic theorists like Marx and Engels can write poetry like this about economic ideas, what would happen if I, as a poet, began to write economic theory as lived by everyday people? And I started at about the time that I met Naomi, I was starting to work on these poems that eventually became uh, Inside the Money Machine, which is, you see on your screen, the graphic is a picture that Leslie took in, um, in the, on, the, uh, on 7th Avenue in the West Village, actually right in front of what is now a library, but it used to be the Women's House of Detention in, um, in Greenwich Village. It, and it's, there's a, a, a special irony. You see the roses, they're coming through the fence that's around what used to be the prison. And so it's looking up, up 7th Avenue, uh, right there at the old prison. Um, so I want to read. I, I want to read you a poem from Inside the Money Machine, where I'm giving it my best to try to um, convey a critique of capitalism as a socialist, as a communist, without using any of that economic language, but actually showing what happens to us when we live in this system. Um, as Naomi did in The Money Tree. You know, when she wrote The Money Tree, the part I read you, the part that I read you was about the way that our bodies produce profits in The Money Tree. Out of our actual physical selves, we are making that money for the people who pluck the green buds from us. So I wrote a whole book where I just ran around, walked around and watched people and thought about people and looked at how they were doing their work and how I was doing my work. And this poem I wanna read you is about when I got fired. And I'm thinking about it a lot these days because so many people are out of work, right? Getting a pink slip. I should say here, I've spent all of my life all of my working life as a part-time contracted adjunct teacher. When I started teaching at Syracuse, I was still on contract. I had to renegotiate my contract every year, every two years, every three years. I was paid better than most of the grad students. I wasn't a grad student. I was paid a lot better than they were, but I still was on sufferance with my contract, right? This isn't about Syracuse. This is about the school where I taught before that. Getting a pink slip. Mine is electronic. Item 13 in a memo. Then the phone. And then the legal letter from the school's president. You'll be missed. He's misspelled my name. I read the letter once and again. The words don't change. When I tell people either it's happened to them or it hasn't. Those inside the fence turning away, those of us outside in the line. The pink slip in the pay envelope, the words that say you're laid off. Fired, out of there like a shell exploding from a howitzer, canned like tuna or corn, dead, done for, shipped out on the next truck. Two women lean into each other, staggered by catastrophe. The plant fence out of focus between, behind them. They hold up a crumpled paper like the photo of some beloved lost to murder or to war. The evidence of what lived a few minutes before. My job, my other self. I wanna close by just turning to my new book. 
Um, we're living in a time of crisis. You all know that global pandemic, global economic crash, renewed attack on people of color, workers, queer people, women, people living with disabilities, immigrants, so many painful losses. What Naomi put into her poems, what I know from a life of struggle is that only the determination and organizing of those of us who are the most vulnerable can turn our lives around. My life with my beloved Leslie Feinberg, another revolutionary, taught me so much about living in the struggle. This is from 1994. We were outside the gates of the, Women's Mich the Michigan Women's Music Festival at Camp Trans, um, protesting the then exclusionary rule there about gen, you know, no gender nonconformist allowed. We finally were allowed to march inside Camp Trans, Trans that day. It was a long, complicated thing that I won't go into. But of course, what was so astonishing was that went not astonishing, not surprising. When we marched, those of us who were marching from outside at Camp Trans, when we were marching, we looked just the same as the people who were inside in all our variety and wildness and everything, you know, genderedness and all kinds of things. You couldn't have told the difference between us all. Oh my God, what a moment that was. Anyway, um, Les is very sick for a lot of our time together and she died in 2014. I carry forward what her love, love and her revolutionary determination gave me. And over the years, I wrote this new book. It's called Magnified. There's a little bit of information there if you want to know more. Um, I wrote poems for her while she was sick, not all about illness, just for her. And I wrote some after she died. And they're gathered together in this new book, Magnified. This is her picture. This is Niagara Falls. This is the edge of Niagara Falls. We were on the Canadian side. There's a little low parapet and then there's something called Table Rock. Leslie climbed over the parapet and leaned over the falls to get this picture, right? So this is the mist below and this is the actual edge of the falls, right? So I'm just gonna read, um, I'm gonna read um, a couple of poems from the book and then uh, turn it back over to Sandy. Hang on just a second. There we go. I have to get used to it being a book now and not a bunch of pages, right? Um, all right, so this is called, whoops. Do not seek to, ro to remain, do not seek to remain. I'm reading Marx in the Eastwood McDonald's. Fleetwood Max, Mac is singing, don't stop thinking about tomorrow. Marx is saying, do not seek to remain something formed by the past, but in the absolute moment of becoming. The words are ripping up the moment and I fall into a tomorrow without you. No morning, no night, no sleeping, no waking, no dawn on your shoulder talking about what is the present. How do I go on? The way yesterday a tree shook its small crescents of seed, angled for planting, sickled for reaping, red in the blue sky. The answer in things, not words. But I yearn to talk to you without end about what makes that beauty and what that beauty makes of us. And then this, just to end with, it's called Sweet sweat. And this is particularly in honor of the Naomi who wrote love poems to women in 1936. East along the line of apple trees on holly, 
the skin of the petals translucent in the sun early, the body and arms of the trees gleaming through. I come closer and press my nose into the blossoms, the fragrance of your skin, faint, sweet sweat, as if salt and all the minerals of the earth are called up into you and alchemized by you, breathing out through every pore what you've lived, your love, your chemistry, your history, the smell of your skin. Thank you. Thank you. Wow. Folks, how about we just take a moment and unmute and show our appreciation before we continue. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Crazy beautiful. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Suzanne, I see you. Kali, I see you. I see you. Yeah. I see so many people. Thank you for being there. So That's many. Breathtaking. I just want to say to Mary, Miriam, behind you, when I was reading, you heard a little bird song. That's my Audubon clock. That was the wood thrush. And Mary published the poem about the wood thrush singing. And yes, yes. That was the first time it was published anywhere. Mary published it. Yes. <laughs> uh, well, Mary and Headmistress Press, you know, continue to publish in that struggle. They, they continue the legacy. They continue to lift the voices. I want to thank you, Minnie Bruce Pratt today for sharing your insights about Naomi Replansky's intrepid, intrepid full life of poetry and activism and loving and of course as well as your own of the same your quest for justice everywhere you've turned and loved and yours in struggle and if we do our work it becomes ours ours in struggle and again for those who appreciate what headmistress press continues to do and for gracing card number 12 <laughs> in the original lesbian poet trading card series and bringing us again the poetry of no naomi replansky card number one yeah my <laughs> friends if you'd like to own your own sets of cards look you can be like mini bruce pratt i saw she has the cards you can be like Yeva. I know Yeva's got every single set. <laughs> you can head on over to Headmistress Press's website to purchase. They make incredible, thoughtful literary gifts for your favorite poetry loving LGBTQ loving human. And how about a great birthday, anniversary, belated Valentine, or happy Women's History Month gift? for your favorite lesbian. Send her a set paired with a book by her favorite writer. So, so fun. Okay. But seriously, folks, let's move now to our open mic. Yeah. Reading. Yeah. Well, we've had a lot of winter around us in the US this week. Oof. But today we have a winter of wonderland of poets. I'm going to e introduce each one of these remarkable people today as they read. And first today, we have Annette Kovragaru. 
who is a gay trans American Israeli writer and photographer. She is a Lambda Literary Fellow and has an MA in Holocaust Studies. Their poetry, nonfiction, and essays have appeared in Peach Mag, Yes, Poetry, and Hey Alma, among others. Annette's debut chapbook, Reality in Bloom, from Ursus Americanus Press, was released on the last day of 2020. How about this fact? They live and roller skate in Brooklyn. <laughs> I do. <laughs> <laughs> I forgot I was unmuted. <laughs> I was just <laughs> That's all good. <laughs> um, thank you so much for inviting me to read. Um, and uh, thank you, uh, Minnie Bruce, uh, for your wonderful um, reading and poetry, and then also um, introducing me to um, Naomi Raplansky. Like, that was such a joy. Um, I'm very, very honored to be here. Um, <laughs> So um, as Sandy said, uh, my chapbook, Reality and Bloom, just came out and here, here's a copy of it, um, the cover and everything. I'll, I think I'll, I'll, I'll drop a link in the, in the uh, chat for the book, but um, I'm gonna be reading a couple of poems from the, this book and then um, one more like flash prose piece, um, if I can fit it in, um, all in. Um, so this, uh, this one, poem's called, um, When I Interrupt Easter Cookie Baking to Tell My Mother I Want Top Surgery. So, when I inter interrupt Easter Cookie Baking to Tell My Mother I Want Top Surgery. She asks, will these words ruin the tradition? Her flowered knuckles kneading deep, scraping table wood. Maybe for a little while, I think at her while speaking, no. See, my body is our legacy, a flesh heirloom on display in refrigerator photos spanning milestones and mediocrities. My body is a malady, not then, or maybe then, but now. She says, this dough is sweetened by aging wounds, so what am I? These queries send my eyes to her desperate hands, molding remnants of motherhood, heeding my masculinity. She prays this want untrue with eyes of unshed tears and a patient heart. Together we remove finished trays, witness to what has risen. Thank you. <laughs> um, this poem is um, Fallen. I want perfection, she says, into my bent neck, debris collecting between my toes. I meditate on the book Cold Mountain, my 11th grade English teacher remarking with a prophetic tongue how there is nothing more intimate than, a woman touch, than women touching each other's hair. Fingertip, fingertips settled on scalps like cartographers tracing valleys. And I wonder what to name us, what to name this, the buzzer vibrating on my back as black nests bury stains in the corner of the tub. And I tell her not to notice, to avoid my fallen parts. And yet she hugs me closer my elbows migrating to her thighs for refuge. Um, so those were both from my little chat book and that should be, I think the link just went through um, if you're interested. Um, and yeah, this, so this last piece is a flash prose piece that came out in um, the journal lunch ticket um, pretty recently. Um, and this, actually, I could probably send that as well if you want to like read along. Um, 
So it's the first, um, the first uh, piece um, is called June. If there's blood, I don't feel it. Something called provodone iodine does the trick. Google names the reactions oxidizing and chemocauterizing, uh, prompts continuous Google searches until I near satisfaction. All I know is I got a C in high school chemistry and what worked fucking hard for it. All I know is that snip skin sounds like construction paper snowflakes in summer. Sometimes pride means discarding yourself, the excess, becoming pink and raw again and again. I admit to my surgeon, I'm still scared of my nipples falling off and she laughs. What I'm really scared of is ineptitude and its illusions. I tell the surgeon about my partner's job and the erosion of work-life boundaries, about binging drag race seasons backwards, about protests, this movement. These stitches will dissolve, but my body will remain a monument indebted to ancestry. Marcia, Sylvia, Storme, Polly, Leslie. If there's blood, I only feel it when air echoes and electrifies with black trans power, marching in white with the love of my life, queering Fort Green Park with revolution. The surgeon peels off my skin and the next layer of flesh takes a much needed breath. Cool like bay water at sunset, tide skimming souls, the promise of another day. And I think that's it. Thank you so much for listening. Thank you so much, Annette. We will come back and duly applaud you when we get through all four folks. I'm going to move next to Colleen Shoshana McKee, who was the author of most recent poetry chapbook, Routine Bloodwork, was a finalist for the Charlotte Mew Prize from Headmistress Press. Colleen Shoshana comes from rural Missouri, but now lives in Oakland, California, where she is working on a novel about a possibly cursed circus titled Shlomo the Strongman and the Uninvited Guests. She is also an editor and a writing teacher. Would you please welcome Colleen Shoshana McKee. Thank you so much. Um, this has just been such a marvelous reading and I'm so thankful to you, Sandy and uh, Risa and Mary for putting this on. And um, it's just a terrific honor to read, uh, to follow Minnie Bruce Pratt. I've been reading you since I was just a little baby dyke. Um, so, and, and um, Annette, you were marvelous. So this is just wonderful. Um, I'm going to start with the Villanelle. I've, I've been teaching some women's poetry classes. I'm afraid I'm going to have to leave in about 10 minutes because I have one of them coming up. Um, and we've been talking about formal poems. So uh, here's the Villanelle, uh, The Wayside Inn. In a rented bed, two restless friends trace lines in each other's palms. They don't notice the moon descend, nor do they watch Orion ascend, his arrow pointed at Gemini's arms. In the rented bed, the restless friends grasp each other's familiar limbs as though to protect them from harm. They do not notice the moon descend. Kay is still surprised by her year after year, still depends on the sugar salt taste of her sweat the way she used to rely on the Psalms. In the rented bed, these two friends have learned to hear only one voice in the dark, to pretend Joan's ring encircles only air, to be numb to its unyielding gold as to the silver moon's descent. Everything that has been shall be again, but at five comes the quiet cry of the alarm and the unrested friends in the rented bed rise as the moon fades and descends. Thank you. 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 Thank you
thank you. There's a line, uh, everything that has been shall be again is uh, from William Butler, Butler Yeats. And um, <clears throat> I, I mostly don't write formal poetry, but I do like it. And um, this one is kind of like a collapsed sonnet. It's sort of a weird form I kind of came up with uh, called Lift Up Your Tongue and Say Ah. Her mind's a thermometer dropped on the floor, no way to measure poetic desires. Metallic drops scatter under the door, the dead, they nest in electrical wires. Quicksilver shimmy and shimmer galore, sputtering, grasping, greased vanity. Brittle sweet romances, manic delore, she plays hide and seek with her own sanity. Where are my gloves? What is the time? Where do you run to, cold sweating dream? Why do I crawl without reason or rhyme? Self-splitting toxins, see how it gleams. Mercury silver, mercury gray, a god whose chief talent is running away. Thank you, and I'll read one more. Uh, about half of the poems in here are, are fictional, but uh, uh, fortunately or unfortunately, uh, this, for, unfortunately, this one is not. Um, this is called Just Before the Wedding I Do Not Want to Attend. On the wide rolling grounds of a schoolhouse, bounded by ferns and wild bamboo, I wear a feather in my hair at the request of the bride. My high heels sink into Oregon mud. Over the crowd, the ocean purrs. Two months after the death of my old flame, ankles aching, I endure well-wishers who ask, when will you marry? I smile and nod politely. The creature in my chest grows claws. I wander away from the crowd, away from the salmon and figs, from the chuppah, its red ribbons whipping the wind. I elude the bride, sick over split ends, and my dad, the wide-eyed groom, stout in his suit, galoshing around. My sisters do hair, they laugh, they dance, they do everything right. I wander off to a swing set, grip the cool, thick chains, hold on to their rattle and wait. And with my spike heel, I scratch the name of my dead lover in damp summer sand. I bend into the wind, kick off those heels, and begin to ascend. On the upswing, I glimpse the ocean, a flat blue stripe, calm past the pines. Mountain jays bark at the sun. I pump in my iris silk skirt, billows over my thighs, sand grits between my teeth. Then, a sudden weight on the swing set, creaking, whooping. Who is it below? Three old women, loud wedding guests, pointing their toes at the sun. They smile up at me, they rise. Our rippling skirts are silken flags, golden, emerald, alizarin, crimson. Corsages go flying and sandals thudding into the earth we leave behind. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Colleen. I know that you have to dash off to teach um, but I wanted to give folks a, uh, if you want to hear more of Colleen's poetry, she's going to be reading tomorrow in Cultivating Voices Live Poetry, the, the weekly poetry, um, the other series that I host uh, on Zoom to Facebook, uh, and that will be at 12 noon Pacific. You can hop over to Cultivating Voices Live Poetry. Um, to see the event page for that. Uh, who wouldn't want to hear more from Routine Blood Work? And I hope you have a great class and I'll see you tomorrow. Thank you. <laughs> always, always a pleasure. Well, our next reader is Caroline Earlywine. I love, I love the lilt of that. I love how your name rolls off my tongue. It's beautiful. Uh, uh, Caroline Earlywine teaches high school English in central Arkansas, where she tries to convince teenagers that poetry is actually cool. She was a semi-finalist for Nimrod's 2018 Pablo Neruda Prize for Poetry 
and for the 2019 Vinyl 45s chapbook contest. She was also a finalist for the 2019 Right Bloody Publishing Contest. Caroline earned her MFA from Queens University in Charlotte and lives in Little Rock with her wife and two dogs. Her chapbook, Lesbian Fashion Struggles, was published by Sibling Rivalry Press. Caroline, you got a, you got, you got a good nod from Minnie Bruce there on that title. So uh, yes, thumbs up. Please welcome Caroline Early Wine. <laughs> Thank you so much. Um, such an honor to be here. Thank you to Sandy and Risa and Mary for all the work that y'all do. And Minnie Bruce, what an honor it is to listen and learn from you. So thank you so much for that. And Annette and um, yeah, thank you to, to Annette and Colleen. So I'll just dive right in. This is my book, chat book, Lesbian Fashion Struggles. It's also, um, the, it's a painting from a local artist um, and I love it a lot. So we'll just dive right in. This first poem is called The Only Girl Out at My High School. The only girl out at my high school wore a lot of black. Her pants were wide and bedazzled with chains. She had a lip ring, wore a rainbow of bracelets stacked to her elbow. I remember her walking down the hall with two girls and I wondered if one was her love. I wondered if it was lonely, being a stereo of pride bass booming, intimidating and loud and all of the things girls weren't supposed to be in that small Arkansas town where kids debated over religion between classes, said women were supposed to be silent and gay people were going to hell. My parents told me to take a walk, not a stand. And I mostly listened, slow danced at prom with my own shadow, my face a bouquet of scarlet anytime my name was called in class. I was a violin with the strings plucked out, a symphony of silence, exactly who I was taught to be. She was her own marching band parading down the halls and even the religious ones respected her, liked her taste in music. I once sat with her on an empty stage after play practice and watched her go through a playlist on her laptop. I don't remember the songs, but I remember we laughed. I remember the way I felt awkward but also excited, how I paid attention, like I was hearing an overture, collecting the melodies so someday I could sing them. All right. And this next one, if I have lesbian in the title of a book, I feel like I've got to address that. So this is called Ode to the Word Lesbian. They say you take up too much space in the mouth, all those awkward syllables fighting to be pronounced the heavy L the way the tongue must meet teeth to birth you. I once took you out of a slide about Audre Lorde because my students' laughter at your mention was so disruptive. Black, lesbian, mother, warrior, poet. I recited her quote about silence, the one that ends, it's better to speak, and ignored the irony of my censorship. Lesbian, often rejected for sounding clinical, your sound more like a diagnosis, or medication with a slew of undesirable side effects. In 1925, you were a noun that meant the female equivalent of a sodomite, an inversion. When I was 13 and growth spurted above my classmates, a well-meaning man came up to us in the grocery store and told my father, someday a tall man is going to come and take her away from you. How could he ever have imagined you? The third section of your definition reads erotic, sensual, as if you were X-rated, a word that must be whispered, much too shameful to be said in broad daylight, porn shoved under the mattress. In high school, a boy told me the locker room was littered with rumors that I was a lesbian. The baseball team decided it was hot, okay, as long as you looked like a boy could still insert himself in the fantasy. I have to mention your motherland, Lesbos, surrounded by salt slick water with Sappho and her anguished love poems. And don't we all live there or wish we did? An island of women who wear crowns of mouths that don't know how to quiet, who damn the uncomfortable, who owe men nothing, who own their desire. So I teach high school 
Um, and I'm the sponsor of our school's LGBT club. And um, this is for them. So this is called GSA. One girl lies and tells her mom she's in a culture club. One girl tells us about both times she came out, the first time as a gay boy. One student gives us a new name and pronoun to call them, but only at club meetings. One made rainbow cupcakes for a bake sale before her parents banned her from attending. One boy wears nail polish and eyeliner and reads us his poetry about boys and manatees. One student gifts us with a lesson on black activists on how intersectionality means no one gets left out. One girl wears a suit to prom. One boy hovers at the doorway. One girl wears a gay themed shirt every day. Her favorite says, no one knows I'm a lesbian. One girl puts up club flyers, even if they get torn down. One boy keeps reminding us that a pride day at school is a bad idea, that people will say things. I'm just being realistic, he says, but they put on their rainbow attire anyway. I watch them roam the halls from my classroom doorway, marquees of color splashed among the crowd. The day a student asked me in the middle of class if I was gay, I said yes, even though a teacher at a nearby school was fired for being a bride with another bride, even though later a conservative radio station would post my engagement photo online like a wanted poster, who better to prepare me, to teach me how to live life outside of a closet and the same kids who clap every time I say my wife, who gather around her picture on my desk like it's a holy grail, who are so desperate for heroes, they wear pride flags tied around their necks as capes become the heroes themselves. And I'll just close it real quick with um, a love poem. So this is a short one, it's called A Toast. Today we drink champagne for breakfast straight from the bottle, fry eggs and use the spatula as a microphone, dance when the song demands to be danced to. You kiss me between laughter and we overcook the eggs. This week I picked a dress for our wedding and one for a funeral. I know it should feel wrong to dance, but nothing feels more necessary than to take another slice of champagne, spin you around and pull you in close bury my face in your hair, let the toast burn. Thank you so much. Wow, thank you so much, Caroline. I, I, I couldn't help but think of the connection between, you know, Minnie Bruce's crime against nature and, and you telling the story of being a teacher in your school and having that experience. Um, I had a really great high school English teacher, but boy, I have to say, are your students lucky to have a model like you? Thank you for saying that. A model that. of humanity, yes, thank you. And thank you for those wonderful poems. Well, friends, my Charlie Chaplin hat and I take you to our final reader for today, which is Lynn McGee. Lynn is the author of the poetry collection Tracks from Broadstone Books 2019, Sober Cooking from Spiten Dival Press 2016, and two award-winning chapbooks, Heirloom Bulldog from Bright Hill Press. I love Bertha Rogers, Bright Hill Press 2015, and Bonanza from Slappering Hall Press. What great presses. Starting over in Sunset Park, Lynn's children's book, co-written with Jose Paluz is forthcoming in spring 2021 from Tilbury House Publishers. She lives with her dog, a blackmouth curhound mix in the Bronx, New York. Please welcome Lynn McKee.
Thank you so much. Um, I just feel very full right now. I, it, it feels very emotional. Um, Sandy, you're just a great host always. You bring so much warmth to every event that you host. And Risa and Mary, your work is so important and I admire it so much. And uh, Minnie Bruce Pratt, I, I just have followed your work and been so moved for it for you know decades. Um, and my fellow co-open uh, mic readers, I just loved hearing, hearing you read. It was just wonderful. Um, so I'm going to read uh, three poems. Um, Crimes Against uh, Nature, Crime Against Nature was a really important book for me when I was young. And it, you know, it, it, that the legislation of women's lives by men could result in the tearing away of children from, from their mothers was you know, something that horrified me then. And almost 30 years later, when I was banned from my lover's hospital room because we weren't married and there was nothing we could do about it, I remembered that book and I hadn't thought about it honestly in a long time. And I went back to it and I, and I reread it. And then I wrote Sober Cooking, which is a lot about that experience. So I'm just gonna read um, a poem from that and then a new poem and then a short love poem. Um, small flame. The stroke team, fierce as aliens in their masks and harsh lights, rolled you back to your room, sitting high in your bed and flashing a victory smile, bag of magic dripping into your veins, danger dissolving like falling stars. My hero, you called out to the neurologist. Close call, he chimed in, tapping your feet. Lift your right arm, no, your other right arm, his face going stern when you couldn't say your name. Then time slowed, the room cleared. Your mother arrived, a furious crow yelling down the hall at me, go home, you're not family, go home. And you twisted your face a curtain away. That night I sat by your bed, repeating, your body is already remembering itself. And you shook your head, no. Finally mouthing, I'll try, as light reflected off the East River, saturating the room. And you did try and got back your words and your sardonic eyebrow and pressed your feet against the therapist's hands. Friends spoon fed you cranberry juice and crushed ice. Your narrow body cramped and you gripped my hand as the clock moved its heavy arms. Then surgeons took over and sewed a pump into your chest. A machine forced your breath and they closed ranks around you. I see you at the stove, stirring black beans and corn, hands fragrant with basil. I see your son, feet big, arms wild, clattering down the stairs to hug me goodbye. I see you smiling in your old way, tubes rooted in your arm. Life's too short for bullshit. Get the spare parts and fix me. And I hold like a small flame, your face against white pillows. So thank you. Um, I'm gonna read a, another poem. I, I, my lover did have a document in her file that she had written and she, it wasn't a legal document, but it explained who I was. And, and I guess her family felt they had to invalidate it. So while she couldn't move her arms and legs, they orchestrated a break a breakup from her on, on, on her behalf, the last time I swam. Your sister and mother wrote an email breaking up with me on your behalf and held the laptop yawning toward your face propped on a pillow, syringe taped to your limp arm, tubes trailing up to bags of liquid going slack. Does that sound okay? Your sister asked. And that's all you would tell me, except that you were afraid of saying no with your child in their care. Sweetheart, it took months for me to sharpen back to my old self once that moment of deletion hit and I was banned from your room. It was winter. I made as many trips to Dallas as I could manage. My father's hand was surprisingly light given its mass. I moved a dining room chair next to his recliner and when he asked about you more than once, I lost my patience and he looked lost, then forgot he was lost. I brought ice water, 
muted our movie Titanic and read to him from my laptop how just one of the ship's engines weighed as much as 150 elephants, he quietly took that in. I didn't know a friend was slipping news of me to you as your name climbed the transplant list. I didn't know we would celebrate one day your new young heart, how you made love like a teenager. At first, I thought it would last, those warm shallows where we found each other again and where we parted eventually on our own terms, not children pulled apart by a vengeful parent, but swimmers finding their depth. Thank you. And I'm just gonna end with um, a love poem, Scar. Sometimes I see your scar, dark track where your breast once was. I see you kneeling that first time in my bed, sinewy arms pulling the black muscle t-shirt over your head. I see your surprised smile as I pull out a tiny bottle, squeeze a glistening bead onto your fingers. I'm giving you all kinds of permission. And I feel that tender rush as you slow us down. Thank you. Thank you so much, Lynn. And before I have folks um, unmute so we could give everybody a round of applause, I just wanted to say that, you know, I, I, I can imagine that when Minnie Bruce wrote Crime Against Nature, which you probably are hoping many years later that the strife in that book would not still resonate so vividly in 2021. And yet story after story tells us uh, that, that we continue in the, in this, in the struggles um, of our lives, of, of the things that mean the most to us in our lives. You know, our families, our lovers, our children, and um, the, the literal legal struggles to, to continue. So I wanna thank each of you for illuminating that today. Um, Annette, Colleen, Caroline, and Lynn, and of course, to our spotlight reader today, a person that needs no adjectives. You all know that from the stories you've shared, Minnie Bruce Pratt, sharing the work of another writer who obviously needs no adjectives either, and yet we need to continue to spotlight her work, Naomi Replansky. How about we unmute for a moment and then I'll come back with just a few more announcements before we close out today. Woohoo! Thank you, everybody. Just really, really fantastic. Very poignant. If you have been moved by our reading today, I hope you'll join us next month. Headmistress Press does this every month and every month they throw something miraculous down. Next month on Saturday, March 20th at 12 noon Pacific, that's one mountain, two central, three P, two, two central, um, three Eastern. We welcome, I don't have the cards because they're at my house in Olympia because uh, I'm in Connecticut, but I do have a book of Julie Marie Ward's. Um, Julie Marie Ward will be sharing the work of the ever necessary and ever present Audra Lord. And I remind you all to check your time zones for that reading. And a final reminder for today, of course, that at any time you can purchase trading cards and of course the books from Headmistress Press, all their titles. Well, this uh, has been quite a day. 
I thank you all for joining me and um, everyone in our audience. And uh, I am Sandy Unown, host of The Collectibles here. My book is Boats for Women from Sam and Poetry. Um, I host here the Lesbian Poet Trading Card Series and also, I'm the host of Cultivating Voices Live Poetry Sundays on Facebook via Zoom.